The title of this chapter is The Weekly Test. At two o'clock sharp, the class assembled, including Miss Honey, who noted that the jug of water and the glass were in the proper place. Then she took up a position standing right at the back. Everyone waited. Suddenly, in marched the gigantic figure of the headmistress in her belted smock and green breeches. Good afternoon, children, she barked. Good afternoon, Miss Trunchbull, they chirped. The headmistress stood before the class, legs apart, hands on hips, glaring at the small boys and girls who sat nervously at their desks in front of her. Not a very pretty sight, she said. Her expression was one of utter distaste as she as though she were looking at something a dog had done in the middle of the floor. What a bunch of nauseating little warts you are. Everyone had the sense to stay silent. It makes me vomit, she went on, to think that I'm going to have to put up with a load of garbage like you in my school for the next six years. I can see that I'm going to have to expel as many of you as possible, as soon as possible, to save myself from going round the bend. She paused and... snorted several times. It was a curious noise. You can hear the same sort of thing if you walk through a riding stable when the horses are being fed. I suppose, she went on, your mothers and fathers tell you you're wonderful. Well, I'm here to tell you the opposite, and you'd better believe me. Stand up, everybody. They all got quickly to their feet. Now put your hands in front of you, and as I walk past, I want you to turn them over so I can see if they are clean on both sides. The trench bowl began a slow march along the rows of desks, inspecting the hands. All went well until she came to a small boy in the second row. What's your name? she barked. Nigel, the boy said. Nigel what? Nigel Hicks, the boy said. Nigel Hicks what? The trench bull bellowed. She bellowed so loud she nearly blew the little chap out the window. That's it, Nigel said, unless you want my middle names, of course. He was a brave little fellow, and one could see that he was trying not to be scared by the gorgon who towered above him. I do not want your middle name, you blister, the gorgon bell bellowed. What is my name? Miss Trunchbull, Nigel said. Then use it when you address me. Now then, let's try again. What is your name? Nigel Hicks, Miss Trunchbull, Nigel said. That's better, the Trunchbull said. Your hands are filthy, Nigel. When did you last wash them? Well, let me think, Nigel said. That's rather difficult to remember exactly. It could have been yesterday, or it could have been the day before. The trench bowl's whole body and face seemed to swell up as though she were being inflated by a bicycle pump. I knew it, she bellowed. I knew as soon as I saw you that you were nothing but a piece of filth. What is your father's job, a sewage worker? He's a doctor, Nigel said, and a jolly good one. He says we're all so covered with bugs anyway that a bit of extra dirt never hurts anyone. I'm glad you're not, he's not my doctor, the trench bull said. And why, might I ask, is there a baked bean on the front of your shirt? 
We had them for lunch, Miss Trenchbull. And do you usually put your lunch on the front of your shirt, Nigel? Is that what this famous doctor father of yours has taught you to do? Baked beans are hard to eat, Miss Trenchbull. They keep falling off my fork. You're, you are disgusting, the Trenchbull bellowed. You are a walking germ factory. I don't wish to see you any more, any more of you today. Go and stand in the corner on one leg with your face to the wall. But Miss Trenchbull, don't argue with me, boy, or I'll make you stand on your head. Now do as you're told. Nigel went. Now stay where you are, boy, while I test you on your spelling to see if you've learnt anything at all this past week. And don't turn around when you talk to me. Keep your nasty little face to the wall. Now then, spell right. Which one? Nigel asked. The thing you do with a pen or the one that means the opposite of wrong? He happened to be an unusually bright child, and his mother had worked hard with him at home on spelling and reading. The one with the pen, you fool! Nigel spelled it correctly, which surprised the trench bowl. She thought she had given him a very tricky word, one that he wouldn't yet have learned, and she was peeved that he had succeeded. Then Nigel said, still balancing on one leg and facing the wall, Miss Honey taught us how to spell a new very long word yesterday. And what word is that? The trench bowl asked softly. The softer her voice became, the greater the danger. But Nigel wasn't to know this. Difficulty, Nigel said. Everyone in the class can spell difficulty now. What nonsense, the trench bull said. You are not supposed to learn long words like that until you are at least eight or nine. And don't try to tell me everybody in the class can spell that word. You are lying to me, Nigel. Tell someone, Nigel said, taking an awful chance. Tell anyone you like. The trench bull's dangerous, glittering eyes roved around the classroom. You she said, pointing to a tiny and rather daft little girl called Prudence. Spell difficulty. Amazingly, Prudence spelled it correctly and without a moment's hesitation, the trench bowl was properly taken aback. Humph, she snorted, and I suppose Miss Honey wasted the whole of the one lesson teaching you to spell one single word. Oh, no, she didn't, piped Nigel. Miss Honey taught us to do it, taught it to us in three minutes, so we never forget it. She uses a lots of words in three, she teaches us lots of words in three minutes. And what exactly is this magic method, Miss Honey? asked the headmistress. I'll show you, piped up the brave Nigel again, coming to Mrs. Honey. Miss Honey's rescue. Can I put my other foot down and turn around, please, while I show you? You may do neither, snapped the trench bull. Stay as you are and show me just the same. All right, said Nigel, wobbling crazily on his one leg. Miss Honey gives us a little song about each word, and we all sing it together, and we learn to spell it in no time. Would you like to hear the song about difficulty? I should be fascinated, the trench will said in a voice dripping with sarcasm. Here it is, Nigel said. Mrs. D, Mrs. I, Mrs. FFI, Mrs. C, Mrs. U, Mrs. LTY. That spells difficulty. How perfectly ridiculous, snorted the trench bull. Why are all these women married and Anyway, you're not meant to teach poetry when you're teaching spelling. Cut it out in the future, Miss Honey. But it does seem, but it does teach them some of the harder words wonderfully well, Miss Honey murmured. Don't argue with me, Miss Honey, the headmistress thundered. 
Just do as you're told. I shall now test the class on the multiplication tables to see if Miss Honey has taught you anything at all in that direction. The trench bull had returned to her place in the front of the class, and her diabolical gaze was moving slowly along the rows of tiny pupils. You, she barked, pointing at a small boy called Rupert in the front row. What is two sevens? Sixteen, Rupert answered with foolish abandon. The trench bull started advancing slow and soft-footed upon Rupert in the manner of a tigress stalking a small deer. Rupert suddenly became aware of the danger signals and quickly tried again. It's, it's 18, he cried. Two sevens are 18, not 16. You ignorant little slug, the trench bull bellowed. You witless weed, you empty-headed hamster, you stupid glob of glue. She had now stationed herself directly behind Rupert, and suddenly she extended a hand the size of a tennis racket and grabbed all the hair on Rupert's head in her fist. Rupert had a lot of gold and colored hair. His mother thought it was beautiful to behold and took a delight in allowing it to grow extra long. The trench bull had as great a dislike for long hair on boys as she had for plates of pigtails on girls, and she was about to show it. She took a firm grip on Rupert's long golden tresses with her giant hand, and then, by raising her muscular right arm, she lifted the helpless boy clean out of his chair and held him aloft. Rupert yelled. He twisted and squirmed and kicked in the air and went on yelling like a stuck pig. And Miss Trunchbull bellowed. Two sevens are fourteen. Two sevens are fourteen. I am not letting you go till you say it. From the back of the class, Miss Honey cried out, Miss Trunchbull, please let him down. You're hurting him. All his hair's my fault. Come out. And well, it might if he doesn't stop wriggling, snorted the Trunchbull. Keep still, you squirming worm. It really was quite extraordinary. It really was a quite extraordinary sight to see this giant headmistress dangling the small boy high in the air and the boy spinning and twisting like something on the end of a string and shrieking his head off. Say it, bellowed the trench bull. Say two sevens are fourteen. Hurry up or I'll start jerking you up and down and then your hair really will come out and we'll have enough of it to stuff a sofa. Get on with it, boy. Say two sevens are fourteen, and I'll let you go. Two sevens are four fourteen, he ga gasped Roos Rupert. Whereupon the trench bull, true to her word, opened her hand and quite literally let him go. It was a long way off the ground, and when she released him, and he plummeted to earth and hit the floor and bounced like a football. Get up and stop whimpering, the trench bull barked. Rupert got up and went back to his desk, massaging his scalp with both hands. The trench bull returned to the front of the class. The children sat there hypnotized. None of them had seen anything quite like this before. It was splendid entertainment. It was better than the pantomime, but with one big difference. In this room, there was an enormous human bomb in front of them, which was liable to explode and blow someone to bits any moment. The children's eyes were riveted on the headmistress. I don't like small people, she was saying. Small people should never be seen by anybody. They should be kept out of sight in boxes like hairpins and buttons. I cannot for the life of me see why children have to take so long to grow up. I think they do it on purpose. Another extremely brave little boy in the front row spoke up and said, 
But surely you were a small person once, Miss Trunchbull, weren't you? I was never a small person, she snapped. I have been large all my life, and I don't see why others can't be the same way. But you must have started out as a baby, the boy said. Me? A baby? shouted the trench pole. How dare you suggest such a thing? What cheek? What infernal insolence? What's your name, boy? And stand up when you speak to me. The boy stood up. My name is Eric Ink, Miss Trenchpool, he said. Eric what? The Trenchpool shouted. Ink, the boy said. Don't be silly, boy. There's no such name. Look at, look in the phone book, Eric said. You'll see my father under there under ink. Very well, then, the principal said. You may be ink, young man, but let me tell you something. You're not indeligible. In, yeah. I'll very soon rub you out if you try getting clever with me. Spell what? I don't understand, Eric said. What do you want me to spell? Spell what? Spell the word what? W-O-T, Eric said, answering too quickly. There was a nasty silence. I'll give you one more chance, the trunch bull said, not moving. Oh, yes, I know, Eric said. It's got an H in it. W-H-O-T. That's easy. In two large strides, the trench pole was behind Eric's desk. And there she stood, a pillar of doom towering over the helpless boy. Eric glanced fearfully back over his shoulder at the monster. I, I was right. Wasn't I? He murmured nervously. You are wrong, the trench bull barked. In fact, you strike me as the sort of poisonous little pockmark. That will always be wrong. You sit wrong. You look wrong. You speak wrong. You are wrong all around. I will give you one more chance to be right. Spell what? Eric hesitated. Then he said very slowly, it's not W-O-T and it's not W-H-O-T. Ah, I know it must be W-H-O-T-T. Standing behind Eric, the trench bull reached out and took hold of the boy's two ears one with each hand, pinching them between forefinger and thumb. Ow, cried Eric. Ow, you're hurting me. I haven't started yet, the trench bull said briskly. And now, taking a firm grip on his two ears, she lifted him bodily out of his seat and held him aloft. Like Rupert before, Eric squealed the house down from the back of the classroom. Miss Honey cried out, Miss Trenchbull, don't please let him go. His ears might come off. They'll never come off, the Trenchbull shouted back. I have discovered through long experience, Miss Honey, that the ears of small boys are stuck very firmly to their heads. Let him go, Miss Trenchbull, please, begged Miss Honey. You can damage him. You really could. You could wrench them right off. Ears never come off, the Trenchbull shouted. They stretch most marvelously like these are doing now. But I can assure you they never come off. Eric was squealing louder than ever and pedaling the air with his legs. Matilda had never before seen a boy or anyone else for that matter held aloft by his ears alone miss honey felt sure both ears were going to come off at any moment with all the weight that was on them 
the trench bowl was shouting, the word what is spelled W-H-A-T. Now spell it, you little wart. Eric didn't hesitate. He had learned from watching Rupert a few minutes before that the quicker you answered, the quicker you were released. W-H-A-T, he squealed. Spells what? Still holding him by the ears, the trench bowl lowered him back into his chair behind his desk. Then she marched back to the front of the class, dusting off her hands one, one against the other like someone who had been handling something rather grimy. That's the way you make them learn, Miss Honey, she said. You take it from me. It's no good just telling them. You've got to hammer it into them. There's nothing like a little twisting and twiddling to encourage them to remember things. It concentrates their minds wonderfully. You could do them permanent damage, Miss Trunchbull, Miss Honey cried out. Oh, I have. I'm quite sure I have, the trench bull answered, grinning. Eric's ears will have stretched quite considerably in the last couple of minutes. They'll be much longer now and they than they were before. There's nothing wrong with that, Miss Honey. It'll give him an interesting pixie look for the rest of his life. But, Miss Trunchbull... Oh, do be quiet, Miss Honey. You're as wet as any of them. If you can't cope in here, then you can go and find a job in some cottonwood private school for rich brats. When you have been teaching for as long as I have, you'll realize that no, it's no good at all being kind to children. Read Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Honey by Dickens. Read about Mr. Wackford Squeers, an admirable headmaster of the the boys hall he knows how to handle the little brutes didn't he he knew how to use the birch didn't he he kept their backside so warm you could have fried eggs and bacon on them a fine book that but i don't suppose this bunch of morons we've got here will ever read it because by the look of them they are never going to learn to read anything I have read it, Matilda said quietly. The trench bull flicked her head round and looked carefully at the small girl with dark hair and deep brown eyes sitting in the second row. What did you say? she asked sharply. I said, I've read it, Miss Trunchbull. Read what? Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Trunchbull. You are lying to me, madame, the trench bull shouted, glaring at Matilda. I doubt there is a single child in the entire school who has read that book. And here you are, an unhatched shrimp sitting in the lowest form there is, trying to tell me a whopping great lie like that. Why do you do it? You must take me for a fool. Do you take me for a fool, child? Well, Matilda said, then she hesitated. She would have liked to say, yes, I jolly do, but that would have been suicide. Well, she said again, still hesitating, still refusing to say no. The trench bull sensed what the child was thinking and she didn't like it. Stand up when you speak to me, she snapped. What is your name? Matilda stood up and said, my name is Matilda Wormwood, Miss Trunchbull. Wormwood, is it? The Trunchbull said. In that case, you must be the daughter of that man who owns Wormwood Motors. Yes, Miss Trunchbull. He's a crook, the Trunchbull shouted. A week ago, he sold me a second-hand car that he said was almost new. I thought he was a splendid fellow then. But this morning, while I was driving that car through the village, the entire engine fell out on the road. The whole thing was filled with sawdust. The man's a thief and a raw I'll have his skin for sausages. You see if I don't. He's clever at his business, Matilda said. Clever, my foot, the trumple the trench bull shouted. Miss Honey tells me that you are meant to be clever too. Well, madame, I don't like clever people. You, they are all crooked. You are most certainly crooked. Before I felt 
fell out with your father. He told me some very nasty stories about the way you behaved at home. But you'll, you'd will you better not try anything in this school, young lady. I shall be keeping a very careful eye on you from now on. Sit down and keep quiet.